And we are back here with our guests, uh, Navid and Nassim. And uh, Nassim Asanji, um, I would like to ask you to uh, tell us a few things uh, about yourself uh, before you wrote this book, The um, American Experience. Uh, you went through a lot of formative uh, experiences. So tell us a little bit about yourself and what read, led to uh, your writing this book. Well, a brief introduction. I was born in Shimla in Himachal Pradesh. Oh, that, that's in India. Uh, that, that is in India. In India? Yeah. Okay. I came to the United States in 1972 and worked in the chemical industry as a chemical engineer. I worked in Delaware for ICI, and during that period, I started writing technical articles. And when this uh, internet started somewhere in the 90s, it became very easy for the people like us to express ourselves in the news media. And the uh, first article I wrote was titled as An American Experience. And that was accepted very quickly by a Pakistani newspaper. And that encouraged me to write about the different challenges facing the first generation immigrants. Okay. By well, the way, uh, when I first came to America, I did not even know how to write a proper resume. Okay. Um, what What is it about your writing that you think um, convinced that newspaper to quickly accept it? What, what is it that you're offering that, that they really liked? In this uh, first article, I wrote how the first generation immigrant come to this country and face the job. They don't even uh, have the good accent to express themselves. And slowly, slowly, they learn everything about this country and they make a progress. So based on my own observation and particularly my own experience, I thought it would be a good idea to first narrate my own experience and different phases that I passed through. Okay. And uh, Navid, you, you had some comments on that. Yes. Um, even though Nassim does not have uh, a formal training in, in writing this type of uh, literature, I found it very interesting. He has written uh, these articles and this book uh, as if he was a trained social scientist. Um, for example, one of the articles on how to run an Islamic center in the United States, if you read through that, he... Um, like a trained social scientist, he goes through and describes phases of, of how religious organizations in the United States develop. What is the first stage? What is the second stage? And uh, so, so that was a very interesting uh, and intriguing and striking point for me. And when I got involved with, his, uh, with, with him in interaction and conversations, I found out he's very humble. Uh, in, uh, in accepting the fact that he, he is actually doing a very fascinating job and he has given voice to a lot of uh, um, immigrants uh, who go through these phases and go through, uh, experience these things, but do not have time or motivation or encouragement to write those things down and share that knowledge with the rest of the world. Uh, and that's what Nassim has done, and that I think is a very commendable uh, thing uh, on his part. Okay. Well, uh, and, and, and Nassim, um, the, when you uh, started writing, uh, did you have the objective in mind that you were ultimately uh, going to put a book together? Or did you have an overall purpose, or is this something that just evolved as you were writing? I never thought that I'll publish a book, but uh, over the past 10 years, one after another, for example, due to the economic collapse in 2008, I found the American people in the tent cities. And then I wrote tent cities in the USA. And then I tried to figure out that why the people from South Asia were not there in those tent cities. And then I looked back at the values of South Asia, where the people take care of not only themselves, they take care of their friends, relatives, and other things. So. I wanted to convey that there are certain values from the East which we must inculcate in the American mainstream to leave a legacy of South Asia in this country. 
So it, it continued on and on, and uh, then uh, uh, America got involved in Iraq. So I looked at from a different perspective that how America should have handled because they must learn about the culture and tradition of a country where they are going. Okay. So it no. continued on and then when, when I had about 25 articles, <laughs> then I thought I, maybe I should compile them into a book. Okay. Now, it's, it's very fascinating. We were talking earlier about how America is such an exceptional country and we, we were all agreed this is a fantastic country um, not just simply because of things like religious tolerance, but uh, uh, personally I found just simply because I don't have to pay a bribe to get anything done. Mm -hmm. Everything can be done honestly. You can succeed here honestly and uh, without uh, having to take uh, any kind of um, dishonest means and you can succeed on the basis of your own hard work. And and the as, as we were talking earlier, the kind of toleration and everything that we see around us. But uh, are you saying then that perhaps Americans, because they've grown up in this kind of society, they don't understand maybe the difficulties of operating in the rest of the world, the issues that face other cultures that are much older or are at a different level of economic development? I believe that uh, America is such a good country that the people do not even endeavor to know what is going on around the world. This is my... If you look at the common people who uh, buys a newspaper, the first thing he will take out is the sports page and he will never look where is Pakistan or Afghanistan or Turkmenistan or Uzbekistan. They are not interested. But I think in this globalization, American people have to learn about the culture and tradition of all other countries in the world where, where they are interacting. Okay. And, Go ahead, Navid. And this book uh, uh, provides a very uh, good insight into those cultures. Uh, for example, uh, a very dear, near and dear issue uh, to, to the immigrant families um, is uh, raising their children. And uh, this book uh, basically does talk about, you know, uh, finding a perfect match, or making of a successful marriage, those types of issues that he himself faced, and I believe a lot of other people also face. Um, so, so this could be an interesting uh, point for a debate or a, um, uh, or a sharing of ideas, uh, how to handle those types of, you know, all the good things are on one side, but there, are, there is a price that, that people pay when they come uh, when, when they live in this country. So, uh, so, so this book provides that, that excellent starting point for that conversation. Okay. This is the View D Newark 91.3 FM. This is your host, Shodab. And we'll be back with our guests, uh, Navid and uh, Naseem, right after these important messages. <laughs> WVUD Newark 91.3 FM, the voice of the University of Delaware, brings you another food FYI. You've heard the saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, according to a scientific study done in Finland, people who frequently ate apples and other flavonoid-rich foods like onions and broccoli had a 20% lower risk of heart disease than people who didn't. Food FYI brought to you by WVUD Newark and Newark Natural Foods. You are what you eat. Eat well. More lemonade, honey? Well, thank you, Margaret. I really do enjoy these lazy Friday nights. City folk have it all wrong with their lights and noise. Here there ain't nothing but the frogs, the crickets, and the programming of Backwoods Radio. Oh, I do love his programming, Sal. He plays all my favorites from Keith Urban, Josh Turner, Brad Paisley. Oh, I do love Brad Paisley. <laughs> oh, Margaret. You've been spending too much time with your city friends again. That's not the point of Big Hoss's show. He's trying to bring us southern folk the music we were brought up hearing. 
Eric Church, Kip Moore. Now that's real country. Oh, James. Guess we just gonna have to agree to disagree. Either way, tune in to Backwoods Radio, Friday nights from 6 to 7.30. Only on the basement. W- and here on WVUD Newark 91.3 FM. This is your host, Shorab, and I have with me in the studio Nassim Hassan, who's written a very fascinating book, An American Experience, about the South Asian immigrant experience in the U.S., and also Navid uh, Bakar. Who- Nassim, I-, I wanted to ask you, um, you had uh, spoken earlier about your formative experiences. You were born in India, then you went to Pakistan after the partition, and uh, then you came to this country, uh, I think you said in 1972. And since then, you've been working in the chemical engineering industry, and uh, now you're working as a technology transfer consultant. And um, to what extent do you think the fact that you got into a technology-focused industry, how has that affected your perspectives, and how did that affect how you wrote your book? This is, I believe, is a dilemma for a technical person. I, for every article I wrote, I had to do the research like we do in the scientific community. Mm -hmm. I had to make a file, for example, I wrote an article, Art, Culture, and Islam. And believe me, I had to research and I found 60 definition of culture. So, <laughs> and uh, secondly, in it's, it's not quite as simple. In the te- it's not uh, that simple. Yeah. And most of my articles start with a very well researched out thoughts, and uh, then I put together like you write a scientific article. Okay. I think maybe that is a flaw, but some people say that uh, it elaborates the subject in much better fashion. Okay. Now, how did that, for example, affect how you uh, wrote? Uh, the section on the uh, the dualities between uh, living in America and still being attached to your own culture? As you know, this is the age of globalization. Frankly, it is possible for us to live in India or Pakistan and not interact with the American mainstream because we can watch Indian movies, we can eat Indian food, we can <laughs> gossip we can watch the drama. So this communication has reinforced the cultural interaction with back home. And uh, another thing which I I would say that uh, I was involved in Pakistani American society, served that as the president and director of Tri-State Area. And I observed Pakistani people and Indian people and the Arab people. And I synthesize their challenges and dreams and what process they go through. So I believe, uh, uh, I would say that uh, my connection with the culture, and then lastly that I, during my job, I went to India and stayed there for six months Mm -hmm. and went many times. So this also helped me in maintaining my cultural interaction with the South Asia. Okay, um, I, I just wanted to ask one more thing uh, about Nassim. Can you tell us a personal experience that made its way into uh, this book uh, based on this uh, theme of cultural duality? Well, f- first of all, I would say that uh, I started my career in Chicago and uh, Frankly, when I came to this country, I did not know how to find a job in this country. And uh, first year I did about to change nine jobs, from one job to another job to another. I'm talking about uh, the manual jobs. Okay. And uh, this rough and tumble of this initial phase gave me this uh, capacity to absorb all kinds of experiences. If I had started right away in a good career, probably I would not be able to have this kind of experience. Okay. So I started started in the factory, started in uh, the print shop and other places, and finally 
I uh, started uh, in my chemical engineering career. Okay. Now, um, were you uh, initially doing uh, manual types of jobs because uh, you did not have the right types of degrees or qualification initially or simply because you were going through an adjustment phase? It is both. First, I did have the knowledge and experience, but I did not know how to find a job, to be very frank. Okay. How to do a good interview and express myself in front of uh, the interviewer and uh, give my side of the story. But secondly, in 1972, 73, there was a recession in the United States. And when the economy picked up, then I found uh, my job okay. and my career. Okay. Navid, uh, you uh, had some comments that you wanted to make on this uh, theme. Uh, Naseem represents um, one, one career path mm -hmm. that uh, an immigrant uh, to the United States has taken. Mm -hmm. uh, however, when he writes this book, he, he is not only confined to his personal experiences, he is also building upon the experiences of others whom he came in touch uh, with uh, over the period of years. So um, I think that's what, that's what makes this book uh, a really interesting read, mm -hmm. um, uh, that he goes back and he tries to, tries to explain uh, what was it like for him, and that gives a thought process to the reader uh, in reflecting upon whatever, thought pro uh, whatever career path they took uh, to become successful uh, in this country, and and I would say that he himself is a uh, is an is an accomplished uh, uh, American uh, who came into the in, into this country uh, not knowing much about the country and then learning so much mm -hmm. about it. Um, going back to the cultural uh, issues, that the the question that you had uh, raised, that how easy it is to detach oneself from from the home culture. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would say that, as this book demonstrates, uh, that it is difficult. It is not easy. Uh, people um, uh, assimilate new new culture, new identity, new um, uh, realities and facts of life. However, it is it is really difficult for an immigrant to detach himself or herself completely from the home country, and you see that reflection in this book again and again. For example, reflections on American policies, American foreign policies about mm -hmm. the home country. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, the situations that the home country may be facing, for example, floods in Pakistan, or whenever there was a tragedy in Pakistan, he could not help himself and he had to uh, to think about it, he had to ponder about it, and he had sure. to write about it, and that's all reflective in the book. Uh, if if you know you're you're more interested in in the contents of the book, I would uh, um, encourage that uh, we have uh, set up a website. It's called www.americanexperiencebook.com. Um, you'll find uh, a lot of detail about the book, the table of content. There's a sample chapter. Uh, you can actually order a uh, book online uh, mm. directly from uh, from that website and also be part of the conversation. There's a blog uh, that you can be part of um, and make comments. We also have uh, um, a book launching ceremony scheduled for December 18th. Um, and I would invite uh, whoever would like to come in and join in that uh, book launching ceremony. It's not just a book launching ceremony. It's also a panel discussion uh, mm. on the same topic. Um, so if you'd like to join in, uh, RSVP for the uh, book launching ceremony, okay. and we'll be very happy to invite you there. Okay. Uh, where is the book launching ceremony taking place? Uh, it's in Newark, um, uh, 698 Old Baltimore Pike, okay. um, where there is uh, Tarbia School. A school is basically hosting that event. Okay. Can you repeat the name of the website? Uh, website is www.americanexperiencebook.com. Okay, www.americanexperiencebook.com. Uh, all one word. Yes. I'm assuming. Okay. All right. And uh, that is uh, fantastic, um, th you know, that you're able to bring together the experience of uh, many different uh, types of people. And so, obviously, you've been communicating with uh, many different types of people from South Asia as, as well as from the Middle East and seeing how they uh, adjust to this country then. As a matter of fact, I went to into <coughs> New York. I went to Little India, Little Pakistan, <laughs> in Brooklyn. I spent the whole day there. I talked to the shopkeepers. I talked to the taxi drivers. 
I talk to the many people to gather what kind of challenges they are facing. So after receiving all the data, then I will start an article. Okay. All right. This has been uh, this has been a fantastic uh, yeah, interview so far. But we're going to have more with uh, Navid and Asim from WVUD New York 91.3 FM. This is your host, Shoda Banerjee. I'm joined on the show today by uh, two very fascinating guests. We have Nasim Hassan, who's written a book called uh, An American Experience about the South Asian immigrant experience in the United States, and also Navid Bakr, who's University of Delaware. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today in the studio. And um, Nasim, I would like to invite you to read a paragraph from your book that, uh, uh, that you said really illustrated a point you wanted to make, so, so go ahead. Well, this paragraph is from uh, my essay, A Journey to the Past of America. I started this uh, journey in Manhattan and going through New Jersey and Delaware. And this journey ends in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I'm reading the paragraph, which is the close of this. The sun is about to go down. It is already dusk with a diffused glow on the horizon over the fertile fields in Lancaster County. I now understand that human happiness does not depend on a big house, an expensive car, or a huge bank balance. If Amish people can live and be happy in simple environments, without any modern amenities, then I can be happy with my life. My journey to the American past has come to an end at Starsburg train station, and it is time to go home. Okay, that was amazing. So uh, this is uh, somebody who started his life journey in India, then migrated to Pakistan during, tra during partition, came to the United States uh, and uh, worked as a chemical engineer. And uh, he comes to this realization after visiting the Amish in Pennsylvania, okay? And y you have one of these moments where you say, okay, only in America could this happen. Yeah. Okay, uh, and it's interesting that you picked uh, the Amish because the Amish are a tremendous illustration of the cultural and religious diversity of this country. The fact that people can live in so many different ways and still be in harmony with the political and economic system of this country. And uh, that's what I got out of this paragraph. Uh, the, what was uh, what was your th what were your thoughts when you wrote Frankly, it? Frankly, I believe the people like Amish people can only survive in a country like America <coughs> because here they have not only the religious freedom, they have the freedom to go into the Amish community or leave that Amish community, and they have survived. And uh, it always amazes me when I go there and see the houses they, which they built and uh, horse-drawn carriages and uh, also a lot of commercial activity there. But uh, you can find the people who are living the way they lived 200 years ago. Okay. And um, the, the thing is that... Um, we, uh, those of us who uh, were born in, say, India or Pakistan, uh, we are aware of, of course, people who live in a different way and who perhaps live in the uh, 18th century or uh, in the cases of some villages that I visited, maybe 10th century, mm -hmm. uh, you know, back in uh, India and Pakistan. And yet we feel this tremendous obligation that we must help these people come into the 21st century and uh, totally change their ways, okay? And yet uh, you experience this thing in this country of people who are living in the same way that they lived 200 years ago, and yet they don't have the kind of deprivations that uh, we have seen in villages that are living in the past, say in, uh, in other countries. So uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but what, what do you think is the difference here? What, uh, what makes this country different, that people can live in this kind of old lifestyle and yet not have the kind of deprivations you see in other societies? You see, this uh, country provides them a lot of facilities in the surrounding area. And particularly, I've seen that uh, when William Penn gave them 
land because he needed the settlement of agriculture community i feel that uh, this could only happen in america not in even in europe where they were first started in switzerland they were pushed out to netherland and from netherland they were pushed out to america so america i i, I believe there are two aspects of it first that it was the open country and there were a lot of land available and they could sustain themselves by using the agriculture and also uh, producing enough for themselves and for their children this uh, could not happen in any other country due to the population growth and also the religious lack of religious freedom okay and uh, navid you you also had a comment on this mm-hmm. yeah. this is this is an interesting hi- highlight of an interesting situation where we feel that we have to help people in the third world country uh become rich or uh, have all these facilities mm-hmm. and yet we are at peace with our neighbors uh uh-huh. the, we do not have any problem amish people living their uh lifestyle that they want to live but we want to change everyone else's life in the world mm-hmm. um and and that becomes apparent uh, when nasim uh talks about the foreign policy issues okay um so i think this is this is one of the major contributions of this book uh that that deserve uh, uh recognition and credit uh in addition to that uh, i also would like to point out that uh this book is not only about uh experiences that uh Nasim had gone through but he also he has reached out to a lot of different um uh, first generation immigrants and has pointed out uh what they have gone through and what they have experienced for example one of the articles towards the end of the book uh is about um a family uh, uh that has lived in the in 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 Delaware for over 30 years now um and the the oldest person of the family uh, the grandfather he immigrated from india to pakistan during partition in 1947 and then he moved to the us and with him uh, came five uh, sons and two daughters uh, and all of them are married and they all have uh, grown children their children have gone to ud uh, most of them uh, and whenever they have a uh gathering there are like 50 60 people from the same family um so he reached out to them and he wanted to uh document their experiences so so you by by reading that chapter you find out uh the the depth of uh, rigor depth and rigor of the research that he has put in uh into this research and during that process you also get a lot of knowledge and insight into how south asian uh, families live in the in the united states okay that was an excellent insight and in, uh, navid I, i'm i'm really glad you're here because i think nasim is just too humble about himself as an author so but uh this is this is truly fascinating but the uh, the quality of your writing i think uh, speaks for itself and uh you know i've, I've seen uh, uh, good writing and uh, this like when i when i heard you read that paragraph that was uh, really something that uh, you know hit me hard Thank that you. yes you you had to come to america to uh, to experience this we're going to be back with nasim and navid here on wvd newark and i'm back here with my guests uh, nasim and navid nasim hasan who's written an excellent book called an american experience uh, which is about the south asian immigrant experience here in the us and nasi we, we were talking about uh, marriage and family and you remarked earlier that the divorce rate among the second generation south asian immigrants is about the same as the general divorce rate uh, in the us and uh, you had your own theories as to why this is uh, occurring so I'm, i'm really interested in hearing your perspective because you've written about it in your book i believe that uh, in india and pakistan the young couple has a lot of social and cultural reinforcement and support what happens in for let's say in india that when the couple gets married they have 
the relatives nearby, they have their parents nearby, they have uncles and aunts. And if anything happens, then they come to rescue, they, if they want the babysitting, they, their children are taken care of. If they need, uh, if they are sick and they need food, their uh, uncle and aunt can su support that. But in the United States, it's not possible for a family to live at the same place Maybe one person, but most of the people, they get married and they move away because they, the jobs are there. Now consider a young couple where husband is working and wife is working and if one of them gets sick, then they don't have any social support system. Mm -hmm. I believe that is one of the reasons, but there are many other reasons why the marriages succeed in India and uh, the same people although they marry in the same culture and they fail so I believe that uh, South Asian community has to create some support system where the young people can come for guidance they can uh, come if there is any problem for example if the child is sick they can come to the people who know how to rear a child if they are if they need any other kind of help they so at this time the south asian community does not have any support system built in where the young people can go and discuss their issues okay that's a that's a very important point you raised because yeah a lot of these issues are actually relegated to uh isolation and shame people don't want to talk about these things yeah. and so they're not able to deal with them and then maybe they end up spending thousands of dollars in therapy or whatever, you know, trying to solve these problems. Problems that could have been solved in a few minutes back in the home country yeah. without uh, uh, too many issues. But uh, the fact is, you're, you're right, marriages often succeed or fail based on actually sometimes practical issues such as this. And then when something like this goes wrong, people assume it's because there's something wrong with the relationship. When in fact, throughout human history, uh, married couples have relied on the greater society yeah. to help them sustain the relationship and the family. So uh, what you're suggesting then, and this is very fascinating, you're suggesting that the South Asian community needs to come together to provide these uh, this kind of support that would have be, been provided by the extended family back home. I believe that uh, not only for the young people, it's also for the people older people who come to see their kids and they do not know how to drive and uh, I'm, I'm talking about uh, the people who are retired in India and they come here mm. or the people who are retired here they simply cannot live with their kids in this country because if the kids change the job they cannot continue moving without any sure. friendship and relationship and so this is another area where I believe South Asian community should look into the challenges because I've seen the people who are close to 80 years old and they are living alone in this country and in various communities. Okay. Navid, you also had a comment on this. Um, as Naseem uh, points out in his book, uh, that uh, religious institutions, for example, uh, uh, for, for Muslims, uh, masjid would be one of the uh, one of the ways that would provide that uh, that uh, association uh, for right. people where people go in for five times a day and they interact with uh, with other people so there's this friendship there's this uh, um, uh, feeling of connectedness mm -hmm. but unfortunately uh, as as Nasim also points out it it hasn't worked successfully because there is not a lot of experience to build upon in this type of setting. Uh, Islamic centers and masajid uh, uh, and mosques, they are relatively newer phenomenon. You know, they started happening in more frequency during the last 30, 40 years. Uh, so, so there is a lack of serious lack of history for these institutions to provide mm -hmm. that kind of support system. I think there is a lot of opportunity uh, that 
that these institutions could work into uh, providing those types of services. However, we cannot just rely on one type of institution. Uh, Southeast Asian communities, they need to develop those types of, for example, retirement centers, um, a, a, maybe a kind of system where uh, younger people can connect with the older people. They can take them out for uh, grocery shopping. They could help them um, uh, take them to uh, different activities that the community may be having. So there is a real need, and, and the book talks about those things and those suggestions. Okay. This is excellent. We'll be back with more Point Three FM broadcasting to you live from the basement of the Perkins Student Center here at the University of Delaware. This is your host, Shoda Banerjee, and I'm here with my guests. Um, first of all, Nasim Hassan, the author of An American Experience, a description of the South Asian immigrant experience here in the United States, and Navid Bakar, who teaches uh, business here at the University of Delaware. And uh, Navid, before we run out of time, I just wanted to ask you, you're having an official uh, release of this book, so please tell us about the date, the time, and the location, and also your website. Uh, the book launching ceremony, book launching and uh, signing ceremony would be on December 18th um, at 1.30 at Terbia School, it is located at uh, 698 Old Baltimore Pike in New York. Um, uh, and uh, we, we will have at 2.30 on Sunday, December 18th, we will also have a panel discussion on the same topic, topic of the book. Um, so this will be a very live program. We'll, we invite everyone to come in and join us. Uh, you can RSVP on the website, uh, www.americanexperiencebook.com. And uh, if you'd like to uh, gather more information, uh, there's a contact us form that can be filled out and uh, someone will get back uh, to the person. And you can also call in 302-533-8004. The number again is 302-533-8004. And uh, the launching and s signing ceremony would be on December 18th. Uh, that's Sunday at 1.30. Okay, and the name of the website again is American Experience Book dot com. Is that correct? Okay, that's great. Um, it has really been fantastic having both of you on on this show. Nasim, I wanted to hear from you. Um, do you feel um, that we've covered all the things that uh, you wanted to communicate uh, to the audience? Uh, and uh, what kind of uh, closing thoughts do you have? Well, I thank you very much for inviting us. I believe that. Uh, South Asian community need to leave a legacy for America. There are a lot of challenges within America like drug problem and other problem. Then uh, the tradition of helping, tradition of saving money and not spending everything, we need to give this tradition as a legacy or South Asian mm -hmm. to American people. And we have to look after all American people because this is a great country and we need to contribute towards the welfare of common people in this country. Thank you. Okay. So you feel that uh, America is a family and because we're a very family-oriented culture, we can uh, contribute a lot as to how to take care of this family. Yeah. Okay. Navid, what do you feel? Um, I think this is an um, excellent book. It provides uh, the reader uh, an insight into uh, the, the cultural issues, the family issues, the religious issues, um, and, and the feeling of awesomeness when uh, first-generation immigra immigrants arrive in, in America. And uh, Nassim has done a marvelous job uh, out, outlining those things and writing about those things and uh, and sharing his knowledge that he has acquired over the period of time. Uh, so I encourage everyone to uh, read this book and be part of the conversation. This is a conversation starter. So uh, I expect that when people read this book, they'll also be motivated to write more books on, on this topic and the related topics. Okay, excellent. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for, uh, for being uh, on the show today. But thank you so much. Again, our guests, Navid Bakar and Nasim Hassan, author of An American Experience, uh, the story of a the South Asian experience here in the U.S. And again, that website is AmericanExperienceBook.com.